be alive so welcome everybody uh, to this yet another webinar and uh, today we have a very interesting webinar with a galaxy of uh, speakers uh, the top the title of today's uh, webinar is uh, vitro retinal surgeries in the era of digital visualization uh, surgical case presentations and at the outset i would like to inform our members and all those people who are uh, watching us on the uh, facebook youtube as well as the zoom uh, today is a little sad day because of the passing away of dr t n usekar who is the founding member and the president of was the president of the vitro retinal society of india so we will observe uh, one minute uh, silence uh, as a uh, as our homage and as our uh, tribute to the departed soul thank you and now i would uh, like to uh, introduce you the uh, chairperson of the webinar dr sairesh shroff who actually doesn't need any introduction at all he's a stalwart in the field of uh, uh, vitro retina and we've known him for years for his uh, 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 tremendous contributions in the field of uh, vitro retina he's the chair of the shroff eye center at new delhi and uh, there are several branches of shroff eye center which are there I have with me my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Rajesh Sena, who is the treasurer of All India Ophthalmological Society, uh, and professor at RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, AIMS, New Delhi. Uh, we also have with us uh, Professor S. Natarajan, uh, again uh, a world-renowned figure in the field of uh, vitro retina, immediate past president of AIOS, uh, and has been on several key positions in AIOS in the past, and managing director of Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital, Mumbai. we have a galaxy of speakers who have actually uh, just as we were discussing have also been uh, recipients of the ars uh, rs uh, video awards uh, several times dr uh, aditya kelkar uh, vitro retina surgeon at national institute of ophthalmology pune and dr uh, darish shroff vitro retinal surgeon and medical director shroff eye center at new delhi uh, so uh, with this i would hand over to uh, dr uh, sairesh shroff who is going to say a few words uh, about the webinar thank you namrata and good evening everyone welcome all the uh, participants and uh, presenters and and everyone who's attending this webinar this evening and on this exciting topic of uh, digital microscopy and uh, i think this has been an exciting development in the field of not just vitreo retina surgery but ophthalmic surgery in general and uh, there were as with any new technology there's always initial apprehension and resistance uh, you we all know when fluorescein angiography moved from film to digital there was a lot of hue and cry about how the resolution could never be matched but we know that ultimately it the digital completely took over because of the tremendous potential and capabilities and ease of use and and promptness which it provided now similarly with microscopy again as in any new technology there will be initial uh, hiccups teething problems but i think ultimately at some stage we will move more and more towards digital microscopy the advantages it gives us the the sort of erect uh, heads up posture and the ability for so many people to be actually getting exactly the same view as the surgeon is getting it's an excellent teaching tool the depth perception that you get is unmatched sometimes even better than what you can get with binoculars 
and of course sim simultaneously there are some challenges for example ot logistics and the placement and all have to be managed uh, depending on the position of the surgeon and the screen and so those are things which you have to adapt and learn to overcome and uh, in certain situations maybe in the resolution also in some situations we may we find may still be a little better in the binoculars than with this so but i am sure as the technology evolves and and this will be continuously improving it ultimately it may completely replace uh, the binoculars that we have conventionally used on the microscope so we have as navrata said uh, three excellent speakers who all of whom have Uh, a lot of experience on the uh, digital microscope system and uh, they will be presenting uh, their views the, the surgical videos and and simultaneously also i suppose the great advantages as well as possibly some drawbacks of these systems i think first of all we have uh, professor dr natrajan he will be our first speaker and he's a person with a vast experience in this and everybody has namrata said he needs no introduction so it's over to you dr natrajan thank you cyrus and uh, me and cyrus go a long way and cyrus grandfather probably was part of mumbai some time and i'm happy to say that and also i'll share my screen thank you namrata and rajesh all india ophthalmic society for uh, giving this opportunity for virtual retinal surgeries so So I just want to tell sell a few words uh, regarding Dr. T. N. Utsaker, and uh, this is the first uh, slide. I we already paid homage to him for a minute. And Dr. T. N. Utsaker was born in January 1923 in a small village called Kadus near Pune in Maharashtra. And then later he did his schooling, and then uh, he was a undergraduate, postgraduate lecturer. assistant professor professor and head of the department in uh, gs at medical college and kem hospital the king edward memorial hospital which is uh, one of the pioneer institutions in the country which is going to celebrate a uh, centenary in, in a few years and uh, he has produced a lot of uh, uh, students and specifically dr rumi jahangir was his uh, young contemporary who became head and retired and he is also the president of the college of physicians and surgeons in mumbai the other uh, thing is uh, when i came from madras to there was madras in 1988 to bombay and i think and other association with upsiders is cyrus also shankarnetra alumni and the same alma mater as i am so we are connected and we all the time learn which uh, thanks to dr s badinath my chief and mentor for uh, even uh, darius and uh, including uh, cyrus so the uh, doctor said he used to visit shankarnetra but i never knew i'm going to shift to uh, bombay but when i came from madras to bombay in bombay hospital dr usegar was the chief of vitreal surgery but surgery there but he was operating once a month there but uh, everybody said oh your dr usegar is there how will you survive and i didn't know anything about him personally but i i'm still uh, happy that i met him in the steps in bombay hospital and i just introduced myself sir i don't know whether you remember me i am dr natrajan i am trained by dr badinath and i and he was so kind and he took care of me as his own son and that time atul was uh, i think probably Probably undergraduate, and later he did his MS and went to Shankaratla again uh, as a vitreoretinal surgeon, and he is now uh, consultant vitreoretinal surgeon in uh, Jaslo. The reason I'm talking more is uh, Dr. Sekar did not have a formal training as vitreoretinal surgery, and he, his other uh, senior uh, colleague, Dr. B. T. Muskati, brother Muskati, was an all-rounder, and uh, he was uh, also head of the department in the same K. M. Hospital once, and I don't remember. Maybe he was before and later, Dr. Sekar. and now, now we had the father and son president that is dr pt muskati and kuresh muskati and dr uh, dr uh, usegar was always a great mentor and in 1987 myself dr badnath were trying to form the vitreoretinal society of india in uh, hyderabad all india ophthalmic society conference where dr usegar was there and dr patnaik was the main person to be uh, along with dr badnath to start but somehow he questioned us so much and dr badnath got uh, 
fed up and he said, I don't want politics. And he, we actually dismantled. We were starting as a group, but we dismantled. And 91, 90, I came to, uh, 88, I came to Bombay Hospital. 90, I started Aitya Jodh. And 91, we had several meetings with Dr. Kanti Modi, Dr. B.T. Muscati, Dr. Ursekar, Dr. Rumi Jahangir, Rajul Parekh, and I think six of us are the um, you know, founding members of the Society. Still, I remember the first conference was held in Calcutta, AOS in 92, and hardly 25 people attended, and we didn't have sponsor. Appa Sami was the first sponsor. With these few words, I wanted to say he's the father figure in vitreoretinal surgery in India. And uh, even though Dr. Badnath did uh, a very vast institute, but Dr. Skeker in his own capacity did that. And the credit to him is, even I think even in 1988, he was quite old, but he was going to Duke's vitreoretinal uh, course every year in Durham. That's the founding Dr. Robert McCamer who in, in, did the course and uh, organized the course and he was attending. And he used that time I didn't travel much, but he used to come and give me the notes. Thanks to you, sir. Wherever you are, may your soul rest in peace. So coming back to the the uh, thanks to Zeiss for the, I call it a 3D fantasy surgery. And the joy of doing 3D surgery uh, is uh, really great. And I'm enjoying it because uh, I actually have designed a Maharaja chair. That means you would like to sit like this and operate. I never thought you will operate like that because I always used to tell you to stay, sit erect like that and operate. But here, uh, Dr. Eckhart used to call it head up surgery. And I, I just watched him a few, maybe last year, not few months, last year, 2019. And uh, I was with Dr. Klaas Eckhart and he was always telling this is going to be the future and two years back he started live surgery using 3D but uh, somehow uh, I think didn't pick up but now I think uh, it's going to pick up. And it's, uh, this is my uh, hey, I'm uh, Professor Dr. Eshnatrajan. I'm the world leader on 3D RTO. I don't have any financial interest. I'm using this Rice uh, 850 RTO and uh, this is the 3D system and we have the monitor here for a uh, uh, the assistant to see as well as the surgeon and uh, you can have uh, sister uh, Smita here. She's a wonderful assistant. We use the world's best technology, the Alcon. Again, I don't have any financial interest. The Alcon uh, uh, system uh, for the uh, the constellation for a vitrectomy, endolaser, and the 3D system. And I'm routinely doing this 3D surgery. And I wear the 3D glass, which helps also to prevent uh, corona. I have a PPE, I have a gown, glove, double glove, and I wear a N95 mask. All of us are wearing N95, thanks to the anesthetist, thanks to Jaydev, my Vilas, and uh, thank you all. So welcome to my show today on RTO 3D. And since you'll see the world-class surgery by a world-class surgeon. Thank you. So this is our uh, team, and I'm happy that uh, anesthetic, every time I was, they have to see through a small, uh, like a peeping hole surgery, and we can see the, so everybody can see what you're doing. So I remember a class Eckhart used to say that uh, earlier, if you make a mistake, only the assistant can see. And that also sometimes he cannot see because the visualization is a problem. But now, the whole world can see or if you're transmitting the whole world can see so i think that's where the uh, you have to be uh, uh, like a well person as you see here you can uh, sit little with a backrest and hand rest and i you visualize this is actually a sphere of fake in the lens in the antechamber and i'm uh, starting the surgery and i'm making the infusion line with the 25 gauge and then i use the uh, and i think as a vitreoretinal surgeon you like to be ambidextrous and thanks to again, uh, I keep remembering my mentor daily, Dr. Badinath, for training us. And we, we use the wet lab and this patient, you can see, uh, and the staphyloma. And that's because of the intraocular pressure went up, I think, in between. And then uh, you, you, you can see here that uh, this particularly, the Zeiss, as I said, I don't have any financial interest, but you have the oculus. If in case you are not comfortable in the beginning, you can use the ocular, but I have turned off the uh, oculus and then I'm using, watching the a screen and that's uh, what uh, is uh, uh, you see here and the and the 3D vitreoretinal surgery uh, is a revolutionary technology to change the way a surgeon performs vitreoretinal surgery benefits both the surgeon and the patient and can be a widely accepted platform in the uh, future and uh, so it's a high 3D 
high definition camera mounted on the microscope, a computer which processes the input and output signals, a high definition display unit, and 3D glasses to view the display. Maybe this is the future of uh, robotic surgery. And the benefits with the digital 3D VR surgery improved ergonomics, posture at the microscope for several leads to musculoskeletal fatigue and pain. And I don't agree with that totally because even here, you have to have the posture and make sure you do exercise. You do dance, according to me, which are surgeons to do dance to uh, make sure that the abdomen muscles, the protagonist and the antagonist, the back muscles have to be strong so that you don't get musculoskeletal fatigue. Many surgeons have got back problem, including Dr. Bhajanath, my other colleague, Dr. Gopal, and I think they were all having back problems. So I think the, the only way to prevent is exercise and you have to be strong. And with the surgical field, displayed on a unit placed at a convenient position, the surgeon can maintain an ergonomically neutral position. This reduces musculoskeletal fatigue for the surgeon. And I think uh, this is what the company claims. As I said, in addition, we should do physical exercise. And I remember Steve Charles always mentioning, he, has, he runs between cases in the OT, and that's what is uh, important to make sure you are. Uh, and the benefits is like uh, what you are seeing, the whole OT can, the OT staff can see with the 3D, and everything is seen on a big screen. And because it's with a computer, you can manipulate the images, you can edit well for the teaching later. So it's an excellent tool where I always say that when you're seeing through a microscope, it's like seeing through a small keyhole and seeing the whole world. Here you're seeing through a wide screen, like a 70 m movie and operating. And I think, uh, and you, you can uh, sit uh, comfortably, you can see in this uh, uh, photograph below, you sit comfortably and operate. And uh, it's a digitally enhanced visualization dynamic contrast can improve brightness even with low illumination apply dynamic digital filters to enhance visualization image quality often better than the traditional microscope digitally magnified inverted images possible and digitally enhanced the uh, significantly low end illumination used translate to lower phototactricity for the foot retina Filters applied can enhance visualization of stained tissue, which in turn requires dilute dyes and digitally applied red-free filter. And uh, good adaptability, switching to 3D, uh, digital 3D VR surgery can be a challenge with a learning curve, even for an experienced surgeon. But I always said, because I think mentally, and I'm passionate about retinal surgery, and I breathe in and breathe out ophthalmology, and that is most of the time with retinal surgery. And because of that, most of the time, I am actually, I really learned a life coach, I underwent a life coach lesson for generally a leadership program, where she taught me, you should have a mental movie and a mental uh, rehearsal of the movie. And that, that means I learned, uh, typewriting, and I don't know how many of you learned typewriting, you have, you're not supposed to see the keyboard and type, and you're supposed to see the page or a book which you're going to type and then do it. So your first uh, lesson will be ASD, FGF, semicolon, LK, J, J, and then you can also type A to Z and Z to A. And that's why I can tell Z to A without any uh, 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 flaw. The reason is, I think you have to mentally practice. And because I learned typewriting at a much younger age, and I didn't, I wanted to be more uh, uh, compete with the guys who are uh, typists. So I, I was mentally preparing after the typing. Same thing I applied. And there is a thing called mirror neurons. In that's where the skill transfer. We have the difficulty of an experienced surgeon giving it to the younger surgeon. So I think you have to have a mental movie. And that's how the learning curve can be made to almost zero. And then uh, RTO has uh, the digital optics, the ad vision, the cloud connectivity, the hybrid mode, auto adjust. And I'm going to show you some examples of surgery. And you see here, uh, 25 gauge, three. So here you make, uh, three port pass panometrectomy. And as, as you see here, you see this entire thing on a 70 mm screen, and then uh, you operate. It's like watching a, a real, a, a something like Star Wars. And that's what was my fantasy when I was a, a kid. And I remember seeing the uh, movie in the uh, IMAX uh, experience, and something like that I enjoyed. And I always wanted to, I, I, I imagine an eye model, where you can walk over the optic disc and see the lens above and then the pupil like that. And that's my imagination. And there was a movie once upon a taken taken from within the eye. So you see the really the processes, the iris, and then similar thing can be done and one day probably possible using a camera within the eye. And you, you, here you see a, 
uh, uh, total retinal attachment. Now, perfluorocarbon liquid being injected, and uh, you, you, you can make sure that they, you see from the disc to the periphery. And all this is uh, possible because of the, uh, I think, the, the whatever you see, your assistant, the nurse, and the boys can see. And I think uh, if you read the Stalad's uh, uh, first uh, chapter, Point number two, he says, you can see there's a giant retinal tear and the perfluorocarbon liquid is filled up to the extreme periphery. And then you are doing the endolase photocoagulation around the giant retinal tear. And you see the retina totally attached and there's a curved uh, laser probe, which we do the endolaser around the uh, break. And I, and I think uh, you had also improved the endo illuminator, which can illuminate all the 360 degree, which is still a uh, problem. And I think uh, here, uh, you for, after that, you do a PFCL silicon oil exchange, and you can see that uh, the PFCL oil, you, you don't see the meniscus, but uh, using the 3D system. And I, I think the things are so smooth, and I, I, you see a small rim of light, which is the, actually the PFCL oil, uh, uh, where you are uh, actually doing it, and you are using the PFC, and you can see some PFCL bubbles, which will be finally removing it using the retinal brush. And finally, at conclusion, you remove all the three ports after completing the oil. And I wanted to say this: and if you have the entry port well, and you don't have to suture them. And I, we have my professor Peter Kroll from uh, Frank, uh, from Marburg, uh, Philips University in Germany used to come and tell me, how can you not uh, suture a, a, a 323 gauge in your history? I said, no, if you make a good wound, and I think you don't have to do suturing. And here, uh, my, the anti-segment surgeon is Dr. Kavita Rao with me, who's doing the cataract with the um, uh, intraocular uh, lens implantation. And I, I'm glad every surgeon in our hospital is using the 3D, but I have switched over from uh, totally the uh, from the regular microscope to the 3D surgery uh, all the time, and I, I do, uh, and uh, only thing is since I have three operation theater, but only one 3D system. I like to operate every case in this OT, and the reason is I think it's phenomenal to use that, and and then later even for teaching. And uh, here because we are going to do a report protecting uh, following that, uh, uh, Dr. Rao places one suture uh, and completes the cataract with the intraocular lens uh, implant. And then after that, I proceed, because I don't like the cataract surgeon coming back again, because I don't do cataract, neither uh, I don't do any PK or anything, but I make the cataract surgeon do everything. And I usually tell them, do your part and get out, and then I get in. And that's what I'm doing here. Now I'm playing uh, after the cataract with the intraocular lens uh, using the 3D and uh, making the three-port uh, parspina vitrectomy and, and proceeding with the vitrectomy. And you can see this is a eye where you are doing a three-port parspina vitrectomy. You see a, a epiretinal membrane so going from the macula to the periphery and make sure that uh, there is actually a, uh, uh, I think it's a post buckle. So you saw some cryo in the uh, periphery and now I'm following uh, vitrectomy, I'm using a steroid to stain the vitreous, and then I use the uh, uh, brush to clear and also the vitreous cutter with suction to clear all the, uh, 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 the steroid. And then finally, under air, I use a brilliant blue to stain the uh, internal limiting membrane. And you can see the visualization, which is the advantage of using this. And I always use a wide angle. I'm happy to say I'm the pioneer in wide angle after Spitzner's introduced a wide angle in 1987, published in one graphe. And after that, somehow, I don't know why, even in Germany, it was not popular. And I think sometimes I say Jesus is not uh, well known in uh, Jerusalem. And I think it takes time. Same thing happened. And uh, is uh, associate Dr. Frank Kosh, who's a professor now in uh, um, the University of Frankfurt. I'm glad it has made me a visiting professor there. Uh, who is using the biome? And I am thinking uh, I was the first used biome for a long time in India and in the world. And I remember teaching in '93 to the when I used to visit Lenox Hill Hospital in New York to teach them to use the biome, but they were not willing. So this is a apparatal membrane which is removed and uh, using the 3D. 
and then thanks uh, uh, this is my three third generation and grandfather and father and i think i don't know whether you have a gene to do microvitreous surgery and i always like to quote uh, my mentor uh, swami vivekananda arise awake and stop not till the goal is reached and the goal will be to do the as charles keepen says do the least to to the retina so that you can atraumatically reattach the retina and enjoy 3d surgery thank you very much thanks to uh, all india optomic society and sai for the opportunity and uh, thank you very much thank you dr natrajan uh, for really very lucidly putting forth the the, the new technology and and the potential and and how it can really help and and the future that's coming so great that was a really nice talk and i think now we have uh, aditya elkar will be presenting talk. navrata would you like to uh, i think uh, it was an excellent talk uh, dr hatrajan and uh, covered very well and your initial part was also uh, very enlightening for all the generations who don't don't know or who are who are unaware rather about dr osekar and like always very inspiring talk dr natrajan uh, thank you namrata i'm glad i made a cornea surgeon listen to it at the top after a long time otherwise we talk something else <laughs> thank you i think aditya now has quite a feast ready for us So good evening. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I hope uh, you are able to see my videos. And uh, Namrata, Aditya, Dr. Sairesh Shroff, and Dr. Uh, the Darius Shroff are a uh, Red Buckler Award winners. And the Red Buckler is actually made in the same as Oscar. And I think not only that, American Society for Retina Specialists most of the time Indian veterinary surgeons uh, win the award. So congratulations to Darius, Sairesh, and uh, yeah. Aditya. Thank you, sir. Congrats. at the same time i'm sure everybody knows that you are from uh, you are the one of the members of uh, asrs and uh, you are amongst the hall of fame of asrs <laughs> last to last year i think you received that award yeah thanks to asrs because they have kept me along with star guards one rafe and uh, also uh, what's his name the uh, or ophthalmoscope that's the first one uh, helmholtz So I'm happy. I'm part of Helmholtz, Dr. Badinath, Steve Charles, and everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, meanwhile, Kripal, can you give the moderators link to Dr. Sairesh Shroff sir and Dr. Rajesh Sena? The moderators link, please, for the questions. Yes, Aditya. So, uh, are you able to see the screen? So yeah, no, it. we are able to see your screen, but your presentation is not open. We can see all the videos. So to make it full I'm screen, uh, you have to open the presentation and make it full screen. We okay. can see your uh, desktop. Thumbnails we can see in your um, folder five December. Yeah. Just give me a minute. Yeah. We'll have to stop share. Yeah. Open it and then. Open it. Open the video first. Open right. the PowerPoint right. presentation and then. Then shares. Then. So me and Namrata can sleep and do Zoom. <laughs> How is it now? Yeah, uh, no, it is not. Now you have to make a full screen. Open one of the presentation. Let us see. Just play one video, whichever video you want to do first. Yeah, just a minute. Sorry for this. No, no, no problem. Are they embedded in a PowerPoint also, or are they all separate? Yeah, separately arranged. But you can go to the share screen, but share the entire the this one the desktop, not just the. You are at uh, your video. You played it when uh, some in the trial. Yeah, I did. In the meantime, uh, Namrata and Rajesh have used the three D, no? Yes, we have uh, used three D, but for anterior segment, not for posterior segment, and I think for anterior segment also. It's oh, a yeah. it's a great tool to have. Maybe yeah. I just wanted to show. I do still yeah, I'm using it. Isn't Doctor Atul using it for uh, VR also? Yeah, yeah, he's using for VR. 
I hope uh, now at least the screen is visible to you. Yes, yes, yes. yes. All right. So I will show you my first case, and this is a chandelier-assisted scleral buckle surgery. Nowadays, the scleral buckling surgery itself has become uh, quite rare. This is a patient with an inferior detachment with a LV vitreous view because of the vitreous haze, and also a little bit of cataract this patient had. So I wanted to uh, do a scleral buckle because the break was inferior, and this is a 45-year-old male. So don't wish to damage his lens at this age. So I'm isolating the muscles first of all, and then we'll put in a chandelier to see the inside part of the vitreous cavity. With an indirect ophthalmoscope, the illumination is very poor, so you won't be able to see as good as what you can see with this uh, chandelier illumination system. So I use the recite. I, I visualize the break. You can see the vitreous haze that was making the visibility uh, poor. So once I mark the break, we are going to cryo and then will place a small segmental buckle over the over that area. I use a sponge because, as you know, I have been trained with Dr. Nathpal sir, and this is his favorite uh, explant to use for uh, retinal detachment surgery. One can also do a radial buckle in this situation, but I prefer to do a segmental buckle because there was a doubtful break also in uh, superior temporal quadrant. So this is the 5-0 uh, suture that you want. And the buckle is in place. And you can see a good indentation effect. In spite of the fact that the vitreous is hazy, the visibility is good because of uh, the chandelier system. So there was a doubtful break also in the superior temporal quadrant, which was also covered by the sponge and the surgery is over. I'll go to the next uh, video now. This is the post-operative outcome. You can see the break is well covered by the buckle and the retina is attached. I'll move to the next video. This is about a diagnostic dilemma in a patient which is being operated for vitreous hemorrhage. After the hemorrhage is cleared, I'm not sure whether this is a hole or a pseudo hole. And the OCT makes it very easy for me to understand that this is just a pseudo hole and I can proceed with my vitrectomy and remove that uh, vitreous traction. And later on, post-operatively, you can see it's a well-flattened retina. Then there's another interesting uh, piece that recently I have uh, come across. This is a three-year-old child who presented to us with a yellow reflex while the parents tried to take a picture on their mobile phone. And this was a Coates disease confirmed on CT scan and also on uh, examination under anesthesia. So we decided to drain this uh, externally. But first I cleared up a little bit of vitreous. I injected some PFCL so as to increase the intraocular pressure so that the drainage becomes more effective. I use a trocar and allow the drainage to happen. You can see the cholesterol crystals being drained and the retina is getting flattened. And intraoperative OCT shows that there's a posterior nodule. Unfortunately, that means the macular area is not very healthy and the visual prognosis may not be that great, but definitely it will help us to prevent the thysis or neovascular complications of in this child. And maybe some useful vision may still be retained. Uh, cryopexy is being done after drainage to the site of a uh, angioma and then the PFCL is aspirated. Next surgery is about uh, a macular hole. After a fluid exchange and ILM peeling, 
this patient also had epiretinal membrane so the epiretinal membrane is removed and i am peeling the internal limiting membrane and try trying to make a inverted flap because of the size of the hole is bigger in this case so i position it over the macula hole and then after the fluid air exchange i want to confirm that this uh, flap is in place or not and i realize that the flap is slightly displaced as you can see the quality of uh, oct even on uh, after air exchange is that good and you can see that the ilm flap has got displaced and therefore uh, i need to make a little bit of a maneuver to reposition it so i reposition it using the diamond dusted membrane scraper as such with a naked eye or through the microscope to identify this displacement would have been difficult but now we can confirm with the oct that this flap is back in place and this patient would end up having a good outcome at the end of the surgery you listening to this you know the next surgery is about a post traumatic patient who developed corneal tear uh, cataract and intraocular foreign body this is the corneal tear being repaired we are just uh, actually literally playing around with the oct to confirm that uh, the wound leak is sealed completely and then proceed and have a look at this uh, oct and you can have see that there is a abnormal bulge of the posterior capsule which means this patient definitely probably has a posterior capsular tear and which we experienced first hand as soon as we introduced to the phaco probe so then we proceeded with the vitrectomy cutter removed the vitreous hemorrhage and the remnants of the lens fragment this patient had a, an intraocular foreign body so you can see kind of frosted branch angiitis pattern occlusive vasculitis caused by inflammation so i'm trying to induce a pvd but it's not getting easily separated and i don't want to induce any breaks here so i decide to now place a pfcl and remove the foreign body impacted onto the posterior pole first although the pfcl floats over the foreign body i am not really concerned because ultimately i am going to use a magnet and the pfcl is only to protect the posterior pole if this foreign body happens to fall back onto the posterior pole again so with the magnet this foreign body is removed the sclerotomy is sutured and then pfcl is aspirated and then along with that i also induce a posterior vitreous detachment and then the endo laser is done around the site of uh, impaction after clearing the epiretinal or uh, the preretinal hemorrhage and i could place the three piece intraocular lens because the anterior capsule was intact and a three piece eye wall could be placed in front of the in in the sulcus in front of the anterior capsule now this is another case uh, which was referred to us for the dislocation of a three piece intraocular lens so after completing the vitrectomy we plan to do a yamanes eye wall without externalizing this intraocular lens so first of all uh, a vitrectomy is being performed then i make two side ports because i may have to use a forceps to hold the lens i use agarwal's markers for uh, this sclerotomy marking and i'm going in with a 27 gauge trocars directed 180 degrees apart and also inject a pfcl on the posterior pole just to 
make sure if the eye will dislocate, it doesn't damage the posterior pole. Then internally to fix this intraocular lens, I am not going to use a needle because this needle might unnecessarily hit some part of the retina. So I'm using forceps through the trocar and using a handshake technique, ensure that the forceps grasp the tip of the haptic. And then I remove the trocars so that externalizing the haptic will become easy. So once the trocar is out, I externalize the haptic transconjunctivally. And then I can plunge this haptic using a diathermy ballpoint, ballpoint cartridge. And then similarly, the second haptic is also externalized using the forceps. And the assistant is holding on to the externalized haptic so as to ensure that it doesn't get dislodged. Once again, we have to ensure that the tip of the haptic is grasped in the forceps so that the haptic doesn't suffer any damage while it is being externalized. So I'm still not very happy with the tip of the haptic it's inside the forceps. So once I'm sure that there is no, and then again, remove the trocars and then externalize the haptic. And then we can plunge this And that's a uh, spherical fixation. The centration of the IOL is very nice compared to the other types of spherical fixated IOLs. That's what I feel. And of course, at the end, you, one has to remove the PFCL. And I'm just checking the macula if there's any uh, cystoid macular edema or a peritoneal membrane. And that's the end of the case. Now, this is a, a patient which has an optic disc pit, as you can see, and a little bit of uh, macular thinning, but I want to confirm there is a macular hole or not, although it can be also confirmed preoperatively, but also intraoperatively, you get a feedback that uh, there's thinning, but no hole. And the previous surgery has been done using an inverted ILM flap. That flap also you can see on the fovea. So in this case, I'm going to use a amniotic membrane graft to fix the pit and to ensure that this graft is easily visible, I have stained it using the brilliant blue dye. So once this uh, graft is uh, placed over the optic pit, I can use the intraoperative OCT to ensure a snug fit of the graft. So here, at least on visible clues, one feels that it might be good enough but the OCT has to confirm that it is in place. But here I saw that uh, it is slightly still floating in front of the optic pit and it may be fitted a little bit better so as to avoid its displacement. So what we did here is uh, once again, the intraoperative OCT came to our rescue and we could snug fit this graft better. Uh, this is a patient with a tractional retinal detachment. And you can see an extensive fibrous proliferation over the disc and macula. Thankfully, it looks more ovascular because the patient also has received avastin in the past. So our trick is uh, uh, to create a small opening in the posterior hyaloid near the equator and separate all the anterior posterior attachments first, and then we attack the membrane. So using a cutter, I'm going over this macular area because I know that a dissection plane has been now identified.
and I always, uh, like Dr. Natarajan sir has shown us, I always keep the cutter over the membrane so as to avoid the risk of uh, iatrogenic breaks. And I also use a reflux mode, as you can see on the left hand side, the proportional reflux to ensure that there is some kind of a hydro dissection that happens under the membranes so that I get another dissection plane and I can easily keep dissecting these membranes right up to the disc without creating any iatrogenic break. And then the rest of the fibrous tissue proliferation, which is extending onto the nasal retina, is then peeled off using the cutter again. Thankfully, in this case, we did not encounter any hydrogenic breaks or any uncontrolled bleeding. Maybe thanks to the preoperative anti VEGF treatment. And again, proportional reflux, wherever we encounter the pegs which are holding on to the membrane, we use the proportional reflux to separate the membranes from the retinal surface. And then we can keep on trimming these membranes with the cutter alone. So in spite of these extensive fibrous proliferations, uh, we did not have to use any forceps or scissors. At the same time, the entire surgery could be still carried out using three-dimensional uh, digital microscope. Initially, we had issues with the learning curve with this microscope to visualize the membranes or to identify the dissection planes. And whenever there used to be any bleeding on the posterior pole to identify retinal tissue underneath the bleeding used to be difficult. But with time and I think with our patients, ultimately we are getting used to this uh, technology more and more and uh, have started liking it as the time passes by. Otherwise, initially, whenever there used to be any complex case, we used to be hesitant in using a three-dimensional microscope. But now we are more and more happy about using this equipment. So since there are no additional, uh, no hydrogenic breaks and patient ultimately did well and this is the post operative uh, picture so with that uh, i come to the end of my presentation i hope you enjoyed these uh, surgical videos thank you great presentation uh, aditya is really nice videos and wonderfully performed surgery thank you Arthur. That's, uh, I think you brought out all the nuances about the diabetic traction detachment, how to manage it, and in fact, unimanually nowadays with the proportional reflux and the 25 gauge cutter and the 27, how you can get into the plane of surgery and even do it uh, uh, not having to resort to bimanual in many situations where earlier one may have needed to do that. And I think both the interest, the optic pit and the ILM and the uh, macular hole were also very interesting. And uh, the only observation I had was that for the, uh, it's very nice that as you saw the position of the ILM over the macular hole and sort of pressing it there. Yeah. But I think practically speaking, you never know why, where it keeps shifting the moment the patient yeah. has gone out of the surgery or the yeah. OT table. So I personally don't bother too much about the position of the IRM flaps at the end of the surgery. Right. They somehow seem to finally rest in that area once the position is prone. And yeah. almost in the reaction, it might be going you do the OCT, the swept source OCT, you find the macular hole closed. I think uh, I was. Uh, Rajan, any any uh, any comments? Daraz? I would just like to make one comment. Uh, ah, Rajesh. Well, yeah. Hi, Rajesh. Yeah. 
uh, it was really wonderful to see that Aditya, the way you you know removed the trocar and did that Yamane technique, I, I really it really was impressive. You know, something good that... idea that you know an IOL which has fallen can be you know we can do a bit technique with that. I think and there's that, some problem with the connection. I mean, that was a nice one. I mean, that was really interesting. Thank you. Thanks, please. So, should we move on to the next? Uh... Yeah, I think so. I would now request Dr. Darash Shroff to. I think, uh, sir, we have to pay. Uh, there's a duty to perform, and that is to play the uh, the sponsor's video at this point in time. I think we can yeah. take the talk after this, Darius. Huh? So, can yeah. we play the sponsor's video, please? Should I share my screen? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, good good evening, everybody. So, uh, after hearing those two exciting talks, I'll be talking a bit about recurrent retinal detachments because this is one beast we really need to tame. And uh, good visualization with digital microscopy really helps us do that. So, I'll just start with some of the merits and demerits. I think. Uh, Dr. Natarajan has really described a lot of these already and so has Aditya, but just a few points which I thought were important about the digital uh, microscope. And then I'll talk about recurrent RD, which are most challenging cases, hence the visualization part is even more critical for the success of these cases. So like we discussed, Artevo 800, is it a new era or is it a new toy in our armamentarium? And it has definite advantages. It has more surgeon comfort, as Dr. Natarajan showed, higher magnification, good depth of focus despite the magnification, and excellent resolution with high magnification, especially at the posterior pole. A, a big advantage of the post pay for the patients is there's low light exposure, so less chance of light toxicity. And you can change the color value of the light which you use while operating. So for example, blue colors for high myopes or albinotic fungus funduses green for the vascular prolifs, and yellow, which has less reflections under air. 
a great advantage of this current system is you can uh, there's a ability to switch from the screen to the microscope view so it, you don't need to really do a lot of maneuvers for that because uh, of the design of this microscope so you can switch and do it as per the surgeon's preference and there's the lag is so it's really earlier always the problem used to be the lag but with this system the lag is almost imperceptible for us uh everything has its disadvantages so of course there are some or logistics for example the cataract surgeons sitting temporarily would need to change the screen position depending on the right or the left eye of the patient being operated for the assistants they need to turn their neck so all this needs more space in the or placement of the vitrectomy machine anesthesia machine etc because you don't want anything coming in the way in the sight of the screen and you need to have that particular distance where you keep the screen some of the other challenges we faced a bit were the reflections or intraocular structures and instruments and sometimes the peripheral working poses a challenge so sometimes we need to vary the illumination quite a bit more and this depends on the intensity used so this is a just a nutshell about this system and let's move on to our topic for today which is recurrent rd which is basically redetachment of the retina after successful primary attachment and although the failure rates have decreased due to advances in surgical techniques and ad advancements in visualization it is a reality which every vr surgeon has to face from time to time this can occur after a pneumatic retinopexy after buckling or after vitrectomy causes would be the ineffective closure of the break at the time of the surgery miss breaks new breaks occurring intra or post operatively development of a macular hole or because of pvr how do we manage this you can either inject a gas and do a new mode retinopexy you can revise or add a scleral buckle you can do a vitrectomy or you can do membrane peeling under oil i'll be showing surgical videos of all these steps so recurrent rd after buckle additional of a buckle element i think i did said buckle has become very rare but i think we are still little old fashion we still do it quite often and this is a phakic patient uh, 47 year old we didn't this patient after buckling you can see the buckle effect but still had some nasal fluid so we didn't want to really go a vitrectomy or touch the lens so you can see we did something which we which is very rarely done now we did a revision buckle where a new buckle element has been added and this is the nasal quadrant so this is just about and the medial rectus and this is where the buccal element was missed and there was a miss break which was located superior nasally so this could be covered and you can see the post op optos picture with a well attached retina below and patient had a restoration of vision if we talk about vitrectomy being done again let's it must be done in a step wise manner so if the, for the anterior segment if there's a cataract please do a phaco or a lensectomy if the iol is unstable remove the lens at the start you decide the gauge and putting a buckling element is quite important in most of these cases why because buckling relieves the circumferential and ap traction it isolates the peripheral retina from posterior forming a new ora serrata and we normally use 240 buckle or 276 uh, tire if they are large inferior breaks spend time on membrane dissection because anterior pvr is more common in these vitrectomized eyes because there's a large skirt of uncut vitreous in the periphery go back tackle the posterior pvr tackle the membranes and subretinal oils then do the ilm peeling if required and the role of retinectomy and tamponade is also going to be discussed so if we can see my first video this was a case where we did bimanual surgery for posterior pvr this was a case first we removed the oil and you can see there was some anterior capsule of phimosis which was preventing view of the retina so as we always said visualization is the key is very important in these cases so we did that we opened the thing and now the chandelier is put the chandelier really helps with which you can just see how much better the view is now and how we can proceed with bimanual surgery with the placement of the chandelier and if we look carefully if we find the cause of of this traction is this napkin ring like membrane which is subretinal so by manually we pull and although there is a retinotomy this membrane is quite adherent and with both hands we pull it out and this is a hand upon hand maneuver which i'll show you later again and this is how we can remove the membrane in toto 
and this is the only way we could re release our the entire traction which was causing this kind of a stiff retina and the retina is uh, opposed and we do laser to this so a few tips and tricks so for tackling subretinal bands this is the hand upon hand we derive manager. inspiration for vitro retinal surgery from the hand upon hand manner in which a bucket of water is pulled out of a well we depict a bimanual technique for tackling subretinal bands in recurrent rd based on the same principle in this 24 year old boy with recurrent rd we carefully choose the point of the retinotomy at the site of confluence of the subretinal bands and marked it with endodiathermy we then entered the subretinal space with n gripping forceps and bimanually removed the bands atraumatically using hand upon hand technique we did so this is another case which was like a courts case we talked about it had also shown but uh, this was a patient who earlier had a treated retinal detachment in the periphery but came with a acute on chronic rd and this is you can just see so there's a lot of subretinal exudation cholesterol crystals etc and first so we find that this is why the retina is not going back so so we realize that we may need to remove this so first we try to remove the epiretinal traction with the bimanual technique and now you can see how the subretinal membranes along with the cholesterol crystals are coming out bimanually and this i think was important because some of this was gravitating posteriorly and would have had a outcome uh, on the visual outcome also so you can see how extensive it is it's we didn't even realize it's this would be so extensive initially when we started the surgery and you can see how nicely it is visualized with the system and this is what allowed us to kind of do it and even at the time of now you can see the fluid air exchange taking place break is settled but now you, you have a look at the posterior pole we are there with the flute needle and you can see these crystals migrating and going in so this also helped remove all this material from the posterior pole in fero tempor in fero nasally also there was a separate area which had been earlier treated and this just did not attach initially so we made a separate small retinotomy and this is what this was settled and laser was done sometimes finding a break is also quite tough in these uh, in certain cases of redetachment so this was a little uh, interesting video we made for that on how to locate an occult break had a recurrence 2 years post silicon oil removal there was an inferior shallow rd along with previous laser marks but no obvious break was seen we tried to locate the break with the help of schlerin with a brush medium but we were unsuccessful we thought out of the box and made a 38 gauge retinotomy and slowly injected subretinal brilliant blue dye as the dye filled the subretinal space we had a eureka moment we saw the blue dye emerge from a very tiny temporal break near a laser mark once the break was found we removed the dye with a brush needle then performed the fluid air exchange and settled the retina so that was something which was just gave us a clue as to where these small occult breaks can be uh what I, other thing which i would like to talk about is circumferential anterior traction and this is something which is a real bug bear in recurrent rd and we had we have described a maneuver called tug of war which was really useful for this so i would like to just show a small animation and a video on that in these cases i like to perform a maneuver called tug of war based on the shearing force a rope undergoes during the killing We use opposing forceps to tug and shear the membranes gently and relieve the traction without resorting to a retinotomy. See this young, highly myopic girl with circumferential traction bands predisposing to anterior PBR. This maneuver allowed us to bimanually release anterior circumferential traction. We took two forceps at 180 degrees to each other. 
then pulled and shredded the bands holding up the retina. Once the bands were separated from the underlying retina, they could be safely trimmed by the vitrectomy cutter. As the traction was released, the retina fell back and settled without requiring any retinotomies. With a sigh of relief, we performed laser to the attached retina. So in fact, this maneuver gives good results in even severe cases where you can have a close funnel kind of detachment. And this is a post buckle also, very often we get such cases. So you can again see the two forceps performing the tug of war. So basically it prevents us from having to do large retinectomies or relaxing retinotomies in the periphery by doing this maneuver. This was another young girl who we operated and retina attached quite well. This is the post-op photograph. This is briefly how it is. You take the two forceps to break the bands. And I'm happy to share this is published in one of the recent issues of uh, Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, Tug of War Biomanual Technique for Anterior Circumferential PVR in Recurrent RD. So now uh, the PVR can be located anywhere. So this is a patient who I wanted to show who had posterior and anterior PVR. So like we described in the slides in the beginning, first we would like to tackle the posterior PVR. And now we are fortunate because we have a lot of instruments in our armamentarium. We use the forceps initially to kind of grasp it and make a plane and then the cutter can be used gently. And because we're using 25 gauge cutters, we can really go close to retina safely and trim these membranes using those. So here we can see it was aphthachic patients, so we don't even use a microscope. We, the anterior PVR we are tackling directly with direct visualization. And in a bimanual way with the right hand scissor, left hand forceps, we are kind of removing the anterior PVR. And now with the cutter, we can separate it and it goes back and gets attached. Uh, this is another case I'd like to talk to you about. I said a, a retina detachment was there in a, a high myop. So this was a patient you can, it was a very high myop, axial length was 33 mm. And there was a failed macule hole. So although he was operated and ILM was peeled, still the macule hole did not close. And then he came to us with a retina detachment and a total vitreous hemorrhage. So that time we could not image the patient. So we were wondering how to close the hole because closing the hole was essential for settling the detachment also. So you just like to have a look at the surgery. So we, in fact, we put us encircling 240 belt buckle and we removed all the heme and we saw there's a bulbous RD and you can still see some of the heme is there in the periphery and there was a large macular hole. So here again, we used amniotic membrane. I think a beautiful video Aditi also showed for this. And we decided that we would plug the hole using the amniotic membrane. This has been described by Professor Rizzo first from Italy and we have not done too many cases, but we have found it useful in uh, cases which are really, really recalcitrant or situations like that, macular holes and very high myopes with a retina detachment. And here you can see bimanually we're settling the amniotic membrane over the macular hole. And uh, PFCL is there in place. Now we do the fluid air exchange and laser all around. And you can see the buckle effect also. So this patient, you can see, this was a failed hole and you can see the nicely amniotic membrane plugging the hole and you can make out what a high myope it is. You can see the contour of the sclera in this. And these are the post-op pictures. You can see a nicely attached retina. In the center picture, you can see the membrane and in the lower one, you can see it plugging the hole beautifully. This is another pre-op versus post-op picture. Membrane peeling under oil. So this is another small thing I tip we'd like to say that if you have a recurrent detachment with a focal area of uh, traction, you don't really need to remove all the oil. You can just do a localized membrane peeling under oil and then you, you uh, can settle the retina quite well with this maneuver. 
tamponade i think everyone knows about it but just a little thing about heavy silicon oil this has been designed to overcome the disadvantages of silicon oil and gas they are heavier than water and because of the high increased density they go good endo tamponade effect to the inferior and posterior pole without having to do the prone positioning in the normal uh, position also or sitting up or lying down supine they give a good tamponade and the problems with the inferior rd is normally the oil has lower density than water it floats up and the surface of the lower retina periphery is not tamponaded well which allows a mix a mixture of aqueous and growth factors which we call pvr soup to kind of accumulate and this always uh, promotes the development of inferior pvr and a recurrent inferior rd so that's why the rds with pvr and open inferior breaks of membranes or patients who are elderly or children with positioning issues this is a good option but the problem is it's of course it's not a substitute for an incomplete surgery and uh the issue of cost and availability is there with this so i'd like to just conclude with this uh, slide which i just explained to you if you have a recurrent rd post vitrectomy and the oil has been removed so see the slide on the right then you need, of course have to do a re vitrectomy and all these maneuvers which i just spoke to you about if the recurrence is in an oil filled eye then look if there's just inferior uh, break and no pvr maybe you can just add a laser or a buckle at inferiorly if there are focal membranes you may just get away with a relaxing retinotomy in that area or membrane peeling however if there's extensive pvr subretinal gliosis or subretinal oil you need to do all the go all the way with the oil removal peeling of the membrane managing the lens with retinotomies bell buckle and refilling the silicon oil these are my acknowledgments thank you very much thank you daras uh, some very nice videos and very informative talk of uh, the principles of tackling this difficult situation of recurrent retinal detachment and all the manifestations of anterior pvr posterior pvr uh, under oil and uh, this failed macular hole as well so i think we really had a very nice session and uh, i'd like to thank all the speakers for their excellent talks and uh, thank aius for giving us the opportunity to have this symposium thank namrata rajesh dr natrajan of course and uh, thank zais for posting this uh, webinar rajesh would you like to uh, i would just like to thank you for uh, you know sharing the session and uh, you know um, sharing your experience with everyone some of uh, the wonderful presentations we had of all the three presenters so thanks to all the presenters thanks to you sir and of course uh, thanks to zais for uh, sponsoring the session and um, we would really love to have such uh, nice sessions in future as well thank you sir thank you thank you thank you everyone